QR code on one of the seats in front of you. Once you're there, you can find today's sermon notes, submit a prayer request, and make a reservation for next weekend's worship service. To reserve your spot for next weekend, open webcc.info, click on News and Events tab, scroll down to the button which reads Reserve Your Seat Now. It will allow you to reserve your spot by campus and service. Summer is here, guys. Uh, isn't that great? Staying up late, going to the beach, maybe going camping. But how about summer camps? Summer camps are for vacation for kids and for parents. Our schedules not only include regular fun-filled activities, but this year we're also adding in a bit of learning. And don't worry, guys, it'll be fun for everybody. While preparing for uh, our hot days, we still have our Olympic size swimming pool, outdoor water activities, and field trips as well. So let's get this summer going. Call today to register at 504 885 4700. Let's make this a summer you'll never forget. The Apostle John once wrote, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. At celebration, we understand that times are hard. We are so thankful for those who have continued to give throughout the pandemic. In doing so, we are giving up what is yours for the good of us all. Thank you so much. If you would like to give today, you can drop your offering off later as you exit. You can also give by texting the word GIVE and the dollar amount to 504-380-9939. You can find that number at the Give Online tab at webcc.info. Thanks again for giving. It is very much appreciated. Today we celebrate the birth of our nation and of ideals that all men are created equal. You can also admit that at many times in our nation's history, we have not realized or lived up to those ideals. So as we look back on the birth of this nation and its ideals of freedom, we also look forward to the day that those freedoms are fully realized and celebrated by every person in our nation. And we honor the lives of every man and woman who has died in the service of those ideals. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, on this day, we celebrate the independence of the United States. America. We thank you that we, we became a nation many years ago. We thank you for the blessings you bestowed upon this nation. We pray, God, that for every person to experience all the blessings, all the all the fulfillment of being a, a member of this nation, being a part of this nation. May you continue to bless our nation. May we be reminded today that the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So may we put you first in every way as we celebrate the birth of our nation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 If you take your Bibles, we uh, ask you to turn with us to 1 John chapter 2. And uh, and I would encourage you to take out uh, your phone, and, and uh, you've got a QR code sheet there. We'd ask you, you can open up your camera app and scan that. It'll bring you right to webcc.info that we were talking about, or you can go to your browser. And if you would do that, you'd be able to find the sermon notes. You'd also be able to find a place that you can put prayer requests, and we would encourage you to please submit those prayer requests. Thank you. Uh, we would ask you to submit those prayer requests so that we would know how to pray for you this week. There may be you that have taken advantage of that over the yeah, Lord's last few weeks, and it's been a benefit for us to know how we can minister to you in that way. Also, there's a place for you to click my decision. So if God lays something in your heart that uh, you need to follow up with, maybe it's to be baptized, maybe it's to be part of a life group. Right now we're in our life group semester break, but maybe God is calling you to be part of a small group, which I would encourage everyone to be part of, or some other decision that God is leading you to do. There's a place for you to register that decision so that we can follow up with you this next week about that decision. Uh, we are continuing our series in Real Christianity. As today we're talking about real Christians grow up. And we again, we're in 1 John chapter 2. You know, one of the greatest hardships and tragedies that, uh, that we see is when something ought to grow, but it doesn't. Has anybody here ever been to vacation Bible school before? It's that, uh, again, there's a few people that, that can remember going to those. They still exist. Churches offer those typically during the summertime. It's a great opportunity for children to uh, to learn the Word of God while having a great time during the week with all kinds of other children from all around the neighborhoods. It's a great, great thing. But one of the things I can remember about Vacation Bible School when I was growing up was that there would often be uh, one of the crap times uh, where we had to plant a seed in a styrofoam cup, put some soil in it, and we were told to bring it home and to watch this little thing pop up and become this plant. Now, I don't know about you, but I have learned one thing in my life, that I was not gifted with the gift of a green thumb. Anybody here got a green thumb? Some of y'all got some can make stuff grow. I think I've been gifted with something that killed me. I mean, that's just what I've been gifted with. But I would always get frustrated because I'd have this little plant. I'd be so proud of this, this green little plant that we're going to put into the, the windowsill and have the sunlight come on it and this little plant pop out. And mine just never would. 
And it was frustrating because I was expecting this nice little plant to grow up, and it just wouldn't do it. I mean, if it did bud anything, it bud a little bit, and it would die off very, very quickly. And I never understood it because I would water it. I would even put the little extra little feed and seed stuff you put in there to make it grow, and it just wouldn't do what it was supposed to do. I did all the right things to help this little seed become the plant that it was designed to be, but it just never could do it. Now, my nana, boy, my nana could grow anything. I mean, she put something in the ground that was going to grow. Some of you probably have family members that are like that. My in-laws can do the same thing. They can take any plant in the native area, and they can grow multiple plants out of it. They just are good at it. My wife and I, we just don't have that same talent. Now, I can say there's probably there's many of us in this room today that may feel like that little plant. <laughs> or maybe you know somebody, if not you, maybe somebody you know, somebody that's in your household or a good friend of yours, it's like that little plant. There just seems to be all the right things going into their life, but for whatever reason, they're not budding up and growing and being all that they're supposed to be. Today, John is going to show us what it means when real Christians grow up. So let's read the passage together in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. John writes this, I am writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won the battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won the battle with the evil one. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving of physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. And we pray that today as we try to break it down and what this looks like in our life, God, that you would open our eyes to see what needs to change in our own lives. Or Father, at least help us to see what needs to change in those that we love, God, that we may be able to pray for them and pour into them these biblical principles. And Father, I pray that as our life gets Christ-centered, that we would see massive change like we never thought possible. And we would see that we could be a part of changing the world around us because Christ is working in and through us. God, we give you the praise on our glory right now for the one that may be here that does not have a relationship with you. That God, today, they would leave to say, I belong to the Heavenly Father through Christ Jesus, his Son. And Father, we want to celebrate just as the angel in heaven celebrates so that life has been changed. We give you all the praise on our glory for it all in Jesus' name. We pray and all God's people said, amen. I want us to understand that the Bible teaches that all Christians are supposed to grow spiritually. We're supposed to be growing spiritually. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us that whether you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to understand that when we are told to grow, that is a command. Peter is saying that you must do this. It's not an option. Secondly, he actually says in the statement that, that, that instead of, he says the word rather. He's pointing us back to a previous verse when, when Peter says this, that it says, so be on guard, then you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. So this verse I just shared from Peter, it tells us that we must choose to grow or else we will regress. Football coach, how many of y'all have heard of the football coach Lou Holtz? Lou Holtz was a famous football coach from Notre Dame and uh, retired now sports casting. And he said this, that nothing on this earth is standing still. It's either growing or it's dying, no matter if it's a tree or a human being. Man, that's so true. Jesus said this way in John 15, 5. Yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, what does it say? Nothing. 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 So failure to grow spiritually should be a fate that we refuse to accept. How I many of y'all want to refuse that today, grow, to not grow spiritually? You want to refuse that. We should not desire to, to not grow. We should, we should want to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to ask ourselves this question as we begin. What does it take to grow up to become all that God has called us to be? 
What does it take to grow up to become all that God has called us to be? I want us to begin by understanding to grow up in the Lord, we must climb to spiritual maturity. We must climb to spiritual maturity. See, there's a lot of Christians that seem to live with this plan of just being Christian enough. Anybody besides me ever been guilty of that? You're just trying to be guilty or Christian just enough to get by that, that somebody might be able to accuse you of being a Christian? But there's a lot of people that have that plan in their life. They want to do just enough for whatever it takes to get to heaven. But they aren't really interested in growing anything beyond that point. That may be their plan, but I want us to understand that is not God's plan. God's plan is for every Christian to grow through the stages in Christian life until we reach maturity in our relationship with him. That's his plan. And so some Christians, we need to understand, are children. Someone say children. Some people are children in their walk with the Lord. You see, when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, they are likened to a child in faith. Why? Because everything is so new and so fresh. They are overcome by God's presence and power in their lives. And so they're just like children, very, very naive to so many things. They just want to rush into God's arms with, with, with just complete abandon. And there are two specific experiences that John describes that are essential to this stage. One, we need to understand that new Christians have experienced forgiveness of their sins. That's the thing, the first essential that's part of being a child in faith. John says this in, in, in 1 John 2.12. He says, I'm writing you, my dear children, because your sins have been forgiven because of who? What does it say? Jesus. Our sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. Now, we talked a lot about that last week in our message. And if there's a, lot, if there's a time that we need to remember that you ask for God's forgiveness of your sins, you need to remember that right here, right now. There needs to be a time in your life that you said, yes, I know that God has cleansed me. God has forgiven me of my sins. If you haven't been able to identify that in your life, then maybe we need to revisit the concept of whether you are a Christian or not. There needs to be a designated time that you says, yes, I know what's happened. I know that God has wiped away all that is in my life. The second thing that we need to understand is that new Christians experience fellowship with the Lord. John says this in John 2.14, I have written to you, children, because... You have known the Father. You see, many people put a lot of stock into beliefs and theology. But in this verse specifically, John is speaking to a relationship. Now understand, someone else's correct theology may have been the part that's helped you understand your need for Jesus. But theology is not what saved you. It was Jesus. And Jesus didn't call us to theology. He called us to relationship. It's only after we have a relationship that we can begin developing a theology. Because theology, I want you to understand this, theology just simply means a thought about God. And so you got theos, that's God, so it's, it's this thought, this concept about God. So what you believe about God, and the reality is, is, is you've got to understand who Jesus Christ is. And somebody else's theology may have helped you understand that, but in order to have fellowship with God, you have to have a relationship with Jesus, or else you don't have fellowship with and so we need to understand that a child in faith is someone that has, one, been forgiven of their sins. Two, they have fellowship with the Lord. Part of having fellowship with the Lord is also to have a desire to please the Lord. You're not going to be a super Christian overnight, by the way. Anybody else figured that? You figured out you're not going to be some, you're not going to be some Billy Graham, or you're not going to be some, uh, some, uh, some other major pastor on the TV airways that you see overnight. That's something that develops over time as God builds you and, and builds you and grows you. We're not going to be super Christians overnight, but we do have a desire when we're a child of faith to please God. We want to, we want to do whatever God tells us to do, just as our children do in our life. Look, my child, my children, when they were small, if I would have asked them to do things, you know what my children would often do when they were small? They would do it. Now, as they got older, that changed. But when they were small, they would often want to do what I asked them to do. Why? Because they had a desire to please their father. They had a desire to please their mother. As a child in faith, we have a desire to please God. Man, we're gung-ho. We're all in. We're jumping in, ready to take off. That's what a child in faith is. And I want us to understand spiritual children struggle with being disruptive, though. They struggle with being dependent. They struggle with being divisive, disobedient, deceitful. Why? Because they're still wrestling with what they just overcame. They're still dealing with the fact that, that being forgiven of sin is still so new. I mean, they're right there remembering all the things that they just did. 
And they're still wrestling with that. Why? Because the devil's trying to kick them in the teeth. Anybody feel like that today? The devil's trying to kick you in the teeth. And it's amazing how the devil just is relentless on our life. I mean, he doesn't want to let us go. He'll try to bring anything and everything up in our past. And if you're a child of faith, if you're new in your faith, the devil's really hard after you. He's wanting to convince you that what you did was a joke, that what you did is what was, was for nothing. You wasted your time. You haven't really changed. It's only as you grow in your faith that you get more distant from that past life that you really understand that the devil is just a liar. But when it's up front, well, it's amazing how quick we can believe what the devil's got to say. Because maybe just, just yesterday you were not a believer, and today you are. So you're just that close to what a former life used to look like. So we need to understand that that, uh, that, 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 that struggle that we have in our flesh, it is real. And it's easy for us to want to flip back. That's why so many people that are young in their faith flip back to their own life so quickly because they just overcame. And they were just forgiven from it. Now, because of these struggles, there's certain, there certain needs, just like biological children have to have. Spiritual children need food to eat. That means Bible study at their level. They need nurture and care. They need ministries to be involved in. And they need, they need to be mentored by someone that's more mature and their faith. And by the way, all of these things at Celebration Church can be found in life groups. That's one of the things we do in life groups. If you're not life group, you're going to struggle to grow at Celebration Church because this is where we provide many of those things. Now, there's another level that we talk about here from Scripture, and that's the concept of parents. Somebody say parents. Parents, parents walk in their walk with the Lord. That's what John's describing here. Now, I can remember becoming a parent. How many parents do we have in the room? Do you remember that first day of becoming a parent? Man, that was an exciting time. Yeah, you were nervous as all get out, and you couldn't wait for that baby to pop out. You couldn't wait to hold them in their arms. You couldn't wait to hear the cries. You couldn't wait to feed them their first time. It was a very exciting time. But how many of you realized that when you became a parent, parent, you still didn't know anything? How many going to be honest about that? Sometimes I still don't know anything. Yeah. When we had that child, we realized that we didn't know anything for me. It, I was still spending money that I didn't have. I was still buying things that I didn't need. I was acting like an idiot, uh, uh, even though I had this small life to take care of. I was still acting like I'd always acted, like I didn't have anybody to take care of. Man, being a parent was a tough thing. But fast forward to today, and there's something about becoming a grandparent. How many grandparents have got in the room? There's a reason why they call it grandparenting, right? That's why they call them grandkids. You wish it, you, you wish. <laughs> You wish that they came first, right? And oftentimes, they're a reward because you didn't kill your own. Grandparents are, being a grandparent is one. I love being a grandparent because I can spoil my granddaughter and I can send her in back home. And let her parents did, just like my parents did to me with my children. I get to dish it back out. But as becoming a grandparent, I feel like I know some stuff. I've learned some things. There's things that I, I can say that I've been there. I've done that. I bought the t-shirt. I've got the, all the all the garments to say I have arrived at some point. I've learned some things over life by becoming a grandparent. I've walked the, the walk. I can sit and talk with my daughters and actually give them wisdom. Although I'm still learning too. But I can actually give them wisdom and things in life because I've already been there. I've already done that. I've already overcome certain things in my life. And if I don't know because as a parent, as I've walked in this life, I, I know if I don't know the answer, I know somewhere to go and get the answer. Well, we need to understand this concept still spills over into our Christian faith. Mature Christians know the Lord intimately. That's what we need to understand when John is speaking to those that are mature in their faith, parents in their faith. John says it this way, I've written to you who are mature because you know Christ, the one who is from the beginning. As a parent in the Lord, it is less about what I know and more about who I know. Jesus has changed my life. And it's easy for me to begin pointing others to Jesus because I know what he's done in my life. And I know what he can do in theirs. We understand that mature Christians represent the Lord powerfully. See, good parents are good role models for those that are around them. Just as I strive to be a good role model to my children so they can know how to parent more effectively, how they can love more effectively with their spouse, we do the same thing in our Christian life. My desire when I die is that people know that I love Jesus and not the funeral talk of love, but that they really know that I love Jesus. Amen. My favorite t-shirt I ever wore, I wore it until it had holes all in it. And it said, live your life 
so the preacher doesn't have to lie about you at your funeral. Now we laugh about that, but all of us have been to funerals where somebody was talked up of being some amazing individual and they were stunned. Anybody besides me been to those funerals? And you're sitting there saying, oh gosh, you don't know this guy at all. Man, this dude was a jerk. They didn't live that kind of life. What are you talking about? I don't want to have that kind of life to you. I want to live my life in such a way that they'll talk about my funeral of truth. That I love Jesus and really love him. That I love my wife and I showed and demonstrated. Not just because I did lip service, but I really demonstrated that love. That I love my kids and I poured into them. I want to be known for that. But in order to be known for that, I've got to live that, y'all. When it comes to being that kind of a Christian, we have to live that before others will know us as that. We can't just have wishful thinking. It doesn't just happen that way. It's not a snap of the fingers and wishing it's going to take place. We actually have to live that out so that people aren't lying about us when we're all said and done on this earth. Each one of us should be a desire to be a role model to somebody. Now, I want us to understand that we're all going to be a role model, but it's a matter of the kind of model that we're going to be. That's your decision. You want those coming behind you to, to live a life that you would, you would despise? You live that life in front of them, they're going to follow your, your steps. And they're going to be the very kind of person that you despise. Yet, who showed it to you? I did. I don't want to be that person. I want to demonstrate something that's biblically focused, that's Christ-centered, that they can look at and say, that's the kind of life I want to live. Now i got to figure out, how do I do it? Well, I can point back to Scripture. You see, mature Christians reproduce, or reproduce for the Lord's frequency. Mature Christians reproduce the Lord's frequency. See, a person can be classified as a parent if they haven't reproduced anyone. Now, I want us to understand there may be someone here today that you were unable to have children. Please don't take offense by that statement. But the reality is, whether we've been able to physically reproduce someone or whether we pour into someone in a spiritual sense, if we've had that ability to reproduce who we are, and we can be qualified as a parent. Jesus said this in John 15, 8. My true disciples produce much fruit. Now, an apple tree is not an apple tree if it ain't got no apples on it. It may have the ability to, to have apples, but if it's not producing an apple, it's not an apple tree. What is it then? It's just a tree. That's all it is. A lemon tree, the same way. Peach tree, same way. If it's not producing the fruit, it's no longer that type of tree. It's just a tree that's freestanding. That's all it is. I want us to understand there are many in this room, I think all of us in the room, that desire to reproduce something good out of ourselves to others. But in order to do that, we, have, we, have, we ourselves have to know where to find the life that God desires us to live. And we have to be living that if we want to reproduce good things. If we want to reproduce other Christians, we have to be living a Christian life and we have to be teaching that Christian life so that others can then too be what we are. I desire just what Paul said. Model, model, life, model life with me. Live after me. Look to me as an example. Because he said, I look after Christ. I want to be like Paul. I want to be that bold. Anybody here want to be that bold? I want somebody to be able to say, Chad, I want to live like you live. Maybe that's scary for somebody. But it shouldn't be. If we're really living a Christian life, we shouldn't fear other people desiring to live like you live. Because we're modeling something that's good and right and holy. After all, God said this, be holy for I am holy. I'm supposed to be living a life that God has told me to live because he's holy. This is what he desires from me. He desires for me to live a set-apart life. And then we have another area that John speaks to in this passage. And he says, he's talking about what we, we would refer to them as teenagers. Someone say, Lord help us. See, teenagers in their walk with the Lord, John talks about here. There may be someone here that's throwing them off a, a little bit because John wrote things out of order. Maybe you just like things to be in order. Maybe you should talk about children first, then teenagers first, then parents first. But that's not the order that John gives them. And I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not going to take out of order, but the Bible is put in a certain order because there's a reason God has put it there. In that way. The teenage stage is perhaps the most difficult stage, and it is where many Christians get stuck in their maturity. 
Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 3. He says, I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and you still aren't ready, for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. Now understand that as we're talking about these, th these three stages, that we're not referring to the physical age, but a spiritual age. Because I have met people that have been 16 that have been spiritual parents because they have learned the secrets of what God wants them to do, and they begin living it out. And I've seen people that are 70 and 80 that are still children in their faith because they never grew beyond that essential stage of asking Christ into their life. So age has nothing to do with what John is talking here about. It literally is a maturity. And every one of us in this room are at a different place regardless of our age. What I've learned that if I'm, if I'm being a child, it's about avoiding responsibilities for things that are your fault. And if you're being a parent, it's about taking responsibility for things that aren't your fault. Then being a spiritual teenager is about learning to take responsibility for things, some which are your fault and some which aren't. And these are the areas of, of a growing Christian that we have to take responsibility for, for our fight against the devil. And teen Christians have to constantly struggle with the devil. John said this in, in, in 2.13, he says, I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won the battle with the evil one. You see, overcoming the devil requires understanding his attacks. We have to know how he works. A child in their faith is not going to understand that. A teenager has begun to understand that, and they're fighting hard, and they're losing sometimes, and they're winning sometimes. A parent wins a lot more, not that they don't lose, but they win a lot more because they've understood the ground attack of the enemy. See, the devil tempts us to get us to cave into things through trials of life, and he also deals with temptations of life. See, it's the trials of life that come as part of being in a broken world that's ridiculed or riddled with sin. And, it's, and it gives people setbacks to the point that because life becomes hard through those trials, we often stop going to church. We stop connecting with, uh, with life groups or Christian friends. We stop reading the Bible altogether. Those hard times really begin putting setbacks in our life, which really make us draw back. When these things take place, the devil has us right where he wants us. But you better be sure he's going to come in full force with the temptations that are unique to each of us. I want you to understand today, just very clearly, that the devil is going to attack you differently than he's going to attack you. There's things that he can get you with he'll never get you with. It's just not an area to struggle for me. And there's areas that he can get me with that he can't get you with because that's not a struggle in your life. The devil has learned very patiently how to watch and observe the areas of our life that are struggling. And he's been at this for a long time, y'all. We're not giving him more power than he deserves, but we need to understand that he's a very powerful, powerful foe. And he's been doing this for a long, long time. And so we need to understand that he's going to come after us in a unique way to get us down and to push us out and to make us feel like we're nothing. You're never going to, you're never going to get me down that road of snorting cocaine. This is not going to happen in my life. I just said, there's nothing there. But that doesn't mean there's not other areas of my life that I struggle with and I got to fight on. There's some of you that may never be tempted to have an affair, but you bring about a good gossip session. Whew, you'll chill on that like a medium rare steak. Go to town. Because each one of us are different. The devil knows our weak spots. It's not that he's all-knowing, but again, as I said, he's a better observer than many of us are in our lives. We have to be cautious about our lifestyles and understand the weaknesses that we have so we don't fall into his traps. And we fall into temptation traps he sets for us. His goal is to discredit us. Overcoming the devil requires using our artillery. John says this in 1 John 2, 14, I've written to you that you who are young because you are strong with God's word living in your hearts, and you have won your battle with Satan. See, winning the battle with the devil involves learning God's word. If you don't know God's word, if you're not in God's word, it's going to be impossible for you to be able to fight the fight that wins with the devil, against the devil. And it's not just learning God's word, we have to live out God's word. See, how many of you have ever purchased one of those do-it-yourself books? Maybe, and I know right now we've got YouTube. Before YouTube, we had lots of do-it-yourself books. You went to Home Depot or Lowe's and you went and bought one of these books, and you had every intention of, of doing some kind of project in there. Maybe it's maybe it's trying to save some money on the electric. Well, I know we have electricity in the room, but 
Maybe you're trying to save some money from the electrical, but do it yourself, right? Uh, and so you get the book and you buy the parts, but somehow or another you never get to the thing, right? Because you read the book, but all you did was take that book and set it somewhere that we like to call a coffee table. And it becomes a nice dust collector. Did that book do any good in your life by purchasing and reading it and setting it down? Not a thing. I want you to understand the Bible is the same way, y'all. We can have a copy of the Bible, which, by the way, uh, the, the, we, we know that a lot of people own the Word. Matter of fact, in America, 9 out of 10 households own a copy of the Word of God. But here's the thing that we need to understand, that the majority of those, according to those same uh, polls that were run, the majority of those have never read more than a few sentences out of it. And what we find in most people's homes is that it's a very, very major dust collector. It sits somewhere on a bookshelf or on a coffee table, and it never is even open. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think we're going to be able to win against the judge if our Bibles are filled with dust? No. Then we say, well, I have an app. I don't even go there. Um, we know. we got lots of apps. i got lots of apps on my phone that I never use. I've downloaded them with a good intention at some point in time. I never use it. And the Bible is one of those apps for many people. It's on lots of people's phones, but it's never open. And if we don't read it and then do what? Apply it and live it out. It just doesn't do us any good. We need to understand that Jesus used the word of God in knowledge and action to actually defeat the devil. We see this when he was, he was in the wilderness. We see him using, quoting the Bible that he had learned. You say, well, he's God. Well, check this out, y'all. He was also fully human. He still had to go through the Hebrew education of a young boy that every other Hebrew boy had to go through. He had to learn the scripture just like you learned the scripture. He had to read it, study it, apply it. And when he was attacked with the enemy, he didn't pull out saying, yo, I'm throwing, a, I'm throwing a wild card down. I'm God. You can't touch me. No. He pulled out verses of scripture and threw them out the devil and said, come on, boy. Give me your best. That's what we have to do in our own lives. We can't ever hope to just read the Bible and never apply it in our life and think we're going to overcome the devil. So let me ask you a question. Are you acting like a child blaming others, always trying to escape blame yourself? Are you acting like a mature parent taking responsibility for the message you didn't create, but they happen to be on your watch? Or maybe you're like some, or maybe you're somewhere in between, still learning these lessons. So let me ask you this question. What steps do I need to take to grow to be a true disciple or a spiritual parent the Lord has called me to be? To grow up in the Lord, we must also conquer spiritual menaces. I love the movie Dennis the Menace. How many of y'all have ever seen that? Mr. Wilson, God love his heart. He's got to deal with Dennis every day. I mean, Dennis is always at his house, and every time he's there, he winds up doing something that causes destruction. And Dennis is a cute little kid. You want to love him, but he's just a little devil, isn't he? Every time he's around, he's messing something up. See, I want us to understand that we all have menaces that stand in our way from standing up and growing in our faith. All Christians struggle with an eternal foe. That's what we call the flesh. We struggle with an in infernal foe. That's the devil. And we struggle with the external foe. That's the world around us. And it's the last one that most of us probably get more in trouble with than any of the others. You see, the world is the invisible spiritual system that is opposed to God in our world. The world system has its own ruler. It has its own followers. How many people do you know that you would describe or that you know that would describe themselves as Satan worshippers. Most of us probably don't know anyone. At most, we might know one, maybe two. But most of us don't know Satan worshippers. I think I've met one, maybe in my entire life, that truly identified as a Satan worshipper. But do you realize that those who follow the world system is exactly that? You realize that? Have you ever thought about those that you see walking on the street that have no identification with the church at all, no identification of Christian, according to the word of God, would be a Satan worshiper? But you would never define them that way. Because we say, that's rude, that's crude. We'd never talk about people that way. But those that follow the world system are exactly what the Bible would describe as Satan worshipers. Even though they themselves may not even realize it. The world and the people who promote the world systems are enemies of God and his family, the church. Jesus said this in John 15, 19, the world would love you if you belong to it, but you don't. 
I chose you to come out of the world, and so it hates you. One of the great desires that growing Christians must master is the desire to be loved by the world. And I want you to understand, that's a real problem for everybody in this room. We all battle that. We all have a desire to be loved by the people around us. Regardless of what they believe or what they stand for, political affiliation, skin tone, we just have a desire to be loved by people around us. And as a result, we will often do whatever it takes, maybe not even realizing we're doing it, just to try to earn the love from those individuals. But the world, it has a great attraction for Christians. But it must be dealt with and overcome at every stage of spiritual growth. If we're going to be what God wants us to be. Overcoming the world requires rejecting the persuasion of the world. John says this in 2.15, Stop loving this world and all that it offers you. For when you love the world, you show that you do not have the love of the Father in you. Y'all, y'all hear that? That's not Pastor Chad talking, y'all. God's Word says that if we love the world, we don't love God. Does anybody in here want to say, oh, yeah. I'm ready to throw God out the window. I don't think there's a person in this room that has that desire. But when we get so fascinated with what the world has, and y'all, there's a lot for the, a lot in the world to love. There's a whole lot of things to draw our attention to. There's a whole lot of things that we want to be a part of. But when we begin falling head over heels with that world, it draws us away from God, and God says we can love him or we can love God, but we can't love both. That's a scary place to be. I love that song, Here's Your Sign, with Jeff Foxworth. Some of y'all might know that one. Some people literally need a sign to know certain things. He said this in one of the verses. Last time I was home, I was driving around. I had a flat tire, and I pulled my truck into one of these side-of-the-road gas stations. The tenant walks out, looks at my truck, looks at me, and I swear he went, tire go flat? I couldn't resist. I said, nope. I was just driving around. Those other three just swelled up right here on me. And he falls up. Here's your sign. Folks, John is here holding up a sign. And he's saying, and he's saying, you need to pay attention to what your affection is on. He says in John 2 16, 1 John 2 16, for the world offers only the lust for physical pleasure, the lust for everything we see, and the pride in our possessions. The world wants us to prioritize pleasure. It wants us to prioritize possessions and power. And it also wants us to prioritize pride in our lives. See, we all want to experience pleasure, but the world wants us to make pleasure or gratification a God in our life. And there's not a one of us in this room that ever think about the things that we enjoy in life as being God. But that's exactly what they become. Too many have mistaken the pleasure they sought after as God's blessings. You ever heard this? I'm too blessed to be stressed. And it's while they're driving some incredible rig or driving a beautiful boat or just bought a brand new gun or, uh, or, or some new technology thing. And I'm blessed. God has blessed me, blessed me, blessed me. And not that God can't bless us with those things, but oftentimes we will say something is God's blessings when in fact what we have gotten has actually become the God in our life. And so that God absolutely has blessed us because it's been a God of deception. And we've done that at the expense of truth. We've done that at the expense of praise. It's not wrong to have things in life, y'all. Nothing wrong with things having, having things in life. But when we desire them more than we do the God of heaven, they become a God in our life. And that's not Pastor Chad making it up. That's what John just said. And I believe the word of God to be infallible. It's true. It's trustworthy. It's without fault. Pride always keeps us from God. And it brings about our downfall. And the devil used the same persuasion to trap Adam and Eve. Maybe you might remember that story. Adam and Eve were doing great. They were walking awesome with God and, and had, had conversations with God every day in the, in the garden. And then all of a sudden, one day, this, this serpent, the serpent comes up and says, oh, you know you want some of that fruit. And they say, oh, no, God said we can't touch that or we'll die. And they say, oh, no, you're all wrong about it. Go ahead and take some because you're going to find that it's good. As a matter of fact, the reason God doesn't want you to have that it's because it's going to open your eyes to help you realize that you can have this power that God is trying to hold on to himself. You can have everything God has. You can be God yourself. Just go ahead and partake of it. God just doesn't want you to be where he is. That's, that's ultimately what Satan or the serpent was saying to him. And all of a sudden what happens? They take the fruit. They bite of it. 
their eyes are opened, but then all of a sudden they recognize they're naked. Now, they've been naked the whole time, y'all. I think I would know if I was naked, right? I think you would know if you're naked, but because there was no sinfulness in the world, they didn't view that as anything wrong. And it wasn't until they did something against God's will that they all of a sudden recognized what God had created, something was wrong about it. And the first thing they did was try to go cover it up. Anybody besides Adam and Eve try to cover up when they've done something wrong? Man, we're good at that. We're real good at that. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not saying that, that, that all of us are like Adam and Eve. I'm not saying that we all we're all evil people seeking out to do evil things. I'm not saying that at all, but I want us to understand that's how the devil works. He takes something that looks really good and it makes it very disgusting. Now we need to also understand. We also need to understand that overcoming the world requires rejection of the plan of the world. When we talk about our plans and our future, how many of our plans, let's just think about that. How many of our plans, I'm talking about what we want to be, what we want to do in life, all those things. How many of those plans that we have for our life are rooted in the Word of God? Think about that for just a minute. If our plans that we have for our lives are not rooted soundly in the Word of God, then something's wrong with the plans that we have. Matter of fact, if it's rooted in anything other than the Word of God, it's rooted in a system of the world. So ultimately, whose plans are they? We can defend them all we want. But if they're not rooted in the word of God, and they're not pointing people to God, because that's the singular will of God, is that we glorify him in all that we do, then we need to understand that they're rooted in the world, the world systems, and the world's rule, according to the word of God. Out of Jesus' mouth, he said, Satan is the prince of the air. And Satan, then, is the one over our plans. But the world and the devil wants to become, they want us to become companions with the world. That is their plan. The Bible says in James 4, 4, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with this world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again, that if your aim is to enjoy this world, you cannot be a friend of God. Man, that scares the fire out of me. When I began thinking about how much am I longing to be friends with the world and the systems. And then I, as I do that, I'm drawn further and further away from God. So we need to distinguish between the people of the world and the ways of the world. This is one of the reasons the Amish are the Amish. They pull away from the world, and as a result, they don't have the taintedness of the world. But we need to understand that the world system is still very much part of the Amish community. That's why so many of them go off a loose end and wind up committing the very things they tried to pull themselves away from. We need to understand that it's powerful, y'all. Somehow sin still makes their ways in their communities, even that are cut off from the electricity. They're cut off from the telephone. They're cut off from anything that the world has dominion over. Yet sin still gets there. When we develop friendships with those who are in the world, that's an important thing that we can share the gospel with them, but we also need to understand that we don't need to get cozy with the ways of the world and the systems of the world. God's call is to make friends with those in the world so that we can share the gospel with them and pull them out. But let's be honest, how many of y'all besides me have been pulled into the very things we've been trying to pull people out of? And we've done it with very good intentions. We want to change them, man. We want to save them out of that mess. But what happens to us is we wind up going right into the world that they're in. And both the world and the devil want us to become corrupted by the world. James says this in James 1, 27. He says, pure and lasting religion in the sight of God our Father means that we must care for orphans and widows in the troubles and refuse to let the world corrupt us. And I want us to understand that no corruption starts big. It all begins with little compromises. And in order to show you that, I want to demonstrate something for you. Hopefully it will pick me up. But... Uh, you know, we talk about compromising the world and being corrupted by the world. It's just like this piece of trash. I mean, this empty water bottle is no good to me, uh, so I throw it away. That's a little thing. And I look at it and say, of course that's trash. That's why I threw it away. And then uh, there's another one, yeah, I throw it away. And then there's another one, I throw it away. But then for some reason, I look at it and say, wait, 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 just a minute. There could be some good uses for this right here. Let me take another look at this. Ugh. Yeah, I know it's trash, but maybe I can just, I can hold on to it for just a little bit. Maybe, anybody besides, uh, besides me can have a tendency to hold on to things longer than you should. Yeah, so I'm going to hold on to it for a little bit because I can put this to good use. Maybe I could cut this off, this top off, and uh, make a funnel out. Maybe I could use that for, a, maybe just a throwaway oil, uh, oil funnel. That's what I'll do with it. This other part, I could plant those plants that I talked about earlier, right? Uh, wait, there's another one. Hey, this is a smaller one. Maybe I can use this to put under the couch for that leg that's missing. <laughs> Maybe it'll hold up. The next 
thing we know, we began looking, and then the next thing you know, we find ourselves, we're, we're digging in the trash and saying, wait, wait, wait. There's, man, there's all kind of stuff up in here. What, man, what in the world? What? Man, there's, oh, the next thing you know, I'll become trash. <laughs> That's how it happens. See, well, we don't realize, and we don't take it seriously in our lives. We don't realize that these corruptions, these things that are corruptions, never start off big. Those compromises never start off big. It, it can be something like, and you know something? I went to church last week. I don't need to go to church this week. And the next thing is, man, I, I got something I need to do this next week. Next thing you know, as a Christian, we say, I haven't been to church. I look back, I haven't been to church in three months. Then we start saying, man, I know I need to read that Bible, man. I need to pick that thing up in six months. Then somebody calls to say, hey, come join my life group, man. I don't have time. I don't have time. The next thing you know, we, <laughs> we go to the bar room and say, you know, it's okay because that's where Jesus would go because the drunks, they need Jesus too. So I'm going to hop up on the stool and I'm going to be a light to them. That's a lie. We're going up and giving some seven and seven. And the next thing you know, we start changing our friends. The guys we used to hang around have been laughing, cutting up, carrying on, encouraging me all the time. Next thing I know, I'm hanging around people that's always negative. They ain't got nothing good to say. They're always doing all the wrong things. And we wonder how we got there. Well, it's because we started off with one thing. And then we found interest in everything else. Next thing you know, we find ourselves at the bottom of the trash can. One small thing became something major. And I want us to understand the devil and the world does not want us to be what Christ wants us to be. He right. wants us to be corrupted. Right. And he also wants us to conform to the world. Even though Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, he says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. See, Christians throughout their history have been notoriously weird, y'all. Christians are weird. Because we say and believe things that don't align with the world's systems at all. I mean, we say things like, give. And then live on the rest. And the world says, wait, give? You ain't got nothing you can give. And it's because we adopted their system means we done spent everything we got. Of course we can't give nothing. Because we've been trapped in the world that they call us in. Start off small and up big. Maybe, you know how it is. We want to finance that stereo system, right? It was only $300. The next thing you know, we finance this. We finance that. We finance this. The next thing you know, we owe more than we take in. We never intended to get there, but it's because we didn't want to pay cash for something. Y'all bring Dave Ramsey up. There we go. But that's exactly what the Bible teaches us not to do. And the Bible teaches a whole host of things not to do. And y'all want us to understand this is what the world tries to bring us into. The first century regarded Christians as cannibals because they were rumored to consume blood and body. After all, Jesus said, as often as you do this, as often as you eat this flesh and drink this blood, that's like, huh? That's nasty. Well, if y'all were here last week, Y'all know that was grape juice and the styrofoam tasting wafer. That's what you got. And that was symbolic of what Jesus did for us. But in the first century, y'all, because they drank, they ate bread, and Jesus said that that was my flesh, and they drank wine, and they said that was his blood, they were rumored to be cannibals. They were weird to people, y'all. They were regarded as treasons because they worshiped God, who wasn't Caesar. And even today, many of our beliefs and practices are misunderstood by the world around us and ridicule definitely. See, we should always look uh, different from the world. There should always be something very noticeably different about our lives, different in our attitudes, different in our holiness and purity, different in our values. Both the world and the devil wants to become condemned by the world, with the world as well. So you must understand the world is coming to an end as well as the devil. And you know as well as anyone that you've met those people that said, if I go down, what? You go down. Oh, you had those friends too? Those friends said, you better not rat me out. You rat me out? I got something on you too. You see, the devil's good about that. The devil knows he's going down, y'all. And as he's going down, he's going to take down everybody he can with him. And so he's going to get everybody and anybody he can to go down and feel awful about themselves. I mean, he'll say things like, you, you know who you really are. You aren't really a Christian. And, and he can say that because we've done those things that we haven't asked God's confession or repentance of and, and forgiveness of. 
and, and he's making us feel bad about that, I want us to understand very quickly that the devil is a liar. And the Word of God says this, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So if you are in Christ today, there is no condemnation in your life under Christ. You may have messed up, you may have fallen, you may have sinned, but God forgives. He says if you're faithful to confess your sins, I am faithful just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see, the key to it all is that God wants us to do one single thing to overcome the world. And that requires us to submit. We can't do anything. I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I've, fall, I've done wrong against my God. But I also know who I am in Christ. And because of who I am in Christ, I can come before him boldly and ask for his forgiveness. Ask for him to help me to repent from that sin, to turn from that sin, and to become all that God wants me to be. You know what? God doesn't let me stay trash at all. God rips the bag off. And what the world is trying to strap on me, God says, I'm not going to have any of it. You are my child. I died for you. I gave my life for you. But in order to grow up, we have to submit. We have to give ourselves to the Lord. We have to say, God, I know that I can't do this alone. And God says, I know. That's why I let Jesus die for you. And that's why I gave my Holy Spirit to be in you. And because of that, you can do all things in Christ to give you strength. Because I'm never going to call you to something I'm not going to bring you to. No matter what difficulty or stronghold we face in life, we can overcome. We can rise up and we can grow. First John 2.15 says, Stop loving this evil world and all it has to offer. For when you love the world, you show that you do not have love for the Father in you. So Jesus says this in Mark 12.30, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The question is, do you want to grow? Do you want to grow? You have to surrender. And folks, I realize that we're in a very difficult time of our world right now. There's a lot going on. There's a lot that is stressing and straining people and dividing people. But I can tell you this. This is one thing I will tell you. There is no system or banner on earth that will ever unify people. Because none of it was designed to. We can come together under all kinds of banners. But it will always be temporary. We were designed to come together under the banner of Jesus. Jesus is our unifier. It's under Jesus that we come together. It's under Jesus that we overcome the differences in our lives. It's under Jesus that we rise up and become more. God didn't put us on this earth just to get along. He put us on this earth to love him and through loving him, we become unified in Christ. We become of one accord. Not because of anything else, but Jesus. Because everything else is divisive. Everything else. But Jesus is the great unifier. And not religion. Jesus. Relationship with Jesus. And I'm afraid there may be some here today that we've been trying too hard to do a lot of things to bring the world together, but we haven't been like Christ. We were called to be like Christ. And I can promise you, I have experienced in my life, Christ unifies the world. And Christ grows us up to be unifiers, making peace in his name. Somebody here needs to know Jesus and say, Lord, for real. I'm not talking about this, I think I know. I know that I know. I belong to Jesus Christ, the Savior, Lord. Is that you? Do you need to grow in your faith? you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, we know right now in this room, Father, we have got to make up all kinds of people. And Lord, your word is tough. Man, it's so tough. But you give us this truth for us to stand on and live our lives by. And God, I pray right now in Jesus' name that we would submit, surrender our lives to you, knowing, God, that we're never going to be all that you want us to be until we, until we surrender, God, until we give it all over. Father, there's someone in this room today that needs to know you as Savior, Lord. They need to pray this prayer right now. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know my sin has separated me from you. I believe that Jesus came to this earth. I believe he died on the cross. And I believe he rose again. I invite you, Jesus, into my life. And forgive me of all of the sin that I have done. I make you the master and Savior of my life. 
Now help me walk in your way. Father, someone here, that's the prayer of their heart. Someone here that needs to walk out of here with their head held high, knowing that they are indeed a child of God. And there's others that are here today, God, that just struggle with life in general. They, they have loved the world a little bit too much. And as a result, it's pulled them away of full devotion to you. But God, today, you would hear their heart and desire to be one with you. And God, that they would give it over to you. They would surrender it all to you. God, they would stop trying to, trying to embrace the world and the love from the world. And instead, only be concerned with your love. And your love has been demonstrated through Jesus, God. So you don't have to show any more. We just have to surrender to that love. So God, may this day be a day of surrender so we can grow into the men and women that you want us to be. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. With your head bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor Chad, today is the day I have trusted Jesus Christ to be the Savior and the Lord of my life. I pray indeed that prayer with you, and I've asked Jesus to be my master and Savior. You say, Pastor Chad, that was the prayer. I just, right now, with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed, put your hand right up and right back down. I just want to celebrate with you today. Is there anyone here today that's made that their prayer? You say, Pastor Chad, what you said is true. I, I have, I'm struggling with loving the world a too much. I, I've allowed some of that stuff to really hinder my growth. If you just want to be honest right now, I want to, I want to pray over you right now. I just thank God for your honesty today. You say, pray for me, Pastor. I have struggled. Just put your hand up and right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Heavenly Father, you're the hearts and lives of those who just lift their hands today. Father, there's others today that, that may be struggling to acknowledge that. But Father, we thank you that you love us right where we are. And you desire to take us where we are and bring us to where we want to be. So God, help us all to fall in love with you all over again. God, help us to surrender everything to you. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for what we're going to do as we leave out of here. We thank you for the testimony that we can become to the world around us, to be a light and love to the world so they may know Jesus through us. And we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for us in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you all so much for coming today. I want to thank you. If you have an offering today, if you can, drop it. We'll have some at the door. Uh, if you'd like to give a web CC, do that electronically. Information is there for you to do that as well. Uh, we want to thank you for coming today. I want to tell you that you're going to immediately, if you want to reserve seats for next week's service, uh, we'll have that online probably this afternoon. And you can go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to be here next Sunday. We want to thank you all for this 4th of July weekend worshiping with us. We don't take that lightly. We're so grateful for you and for your family. So we pray you would have a blessed day. And you're dismissed as we go out on a song.
I mean, if you I would that was if I have to pull it down, like it's just right. like a big thing.
He wanted to take a look at it and see if there was something on six pages go away. You know. How did he look at it? He went down with a stick. He went down with a camera. In the nose? Yeah, he went up the nose. It hurt? It's just sheer pain. It's one of the most uncomfortable things. Anything in your face. I don't you know, like the size of colonoscopy. This is going to be pretty bad. At least a colonoscopy. Man, you ain't old enough for one of those yet. Which I haven't had yet. So That's what I'm saying. You're going to be 50 before you get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I got a colonoscopy. I got four years. I was a child. 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 I was Thank you. 